Euh, bonjour. Euh, vous êtes probablement dans la euh, mauvaise salle. Euh, cette présentation ne sera pas en français. Euh, I was actually thinking, dovrei farla in italiano, così mi capite tutti quanti. Babba di boppi! Uh, but then I realized it was probably better just to stick to English. Um, yeah, I think I want something. Um, okay, so I think we can start. Um, so, if you're here, you probably care about doing UI, uh, doing awesome stuff, it doesn't. Um, but, um, if you're like me, uh, when I started, most of the time, uh, I had kind of that face, uh, and also a guy behind me, I don't know why, it was there. Um, but um, doing UI on Android, you probably heard about that, is kind of a pain. Uh, but to make something amazing, to make sure that your user love the application you do, uh, you have to get to know what lies behind uh, the UI widgets that you use every day in your applications. Um, and that thing that lies behind it is the canvas. Uh, the canvas has got quirks and secrets that nobody will tell you about and you're gonna get crazy trying to understand what the hell is going on. You will most likely going to have to look at the canvas code uh, in the Android open source project or if you're not lucky, which is probably going to be most of the time, you will actually go to the native code, which is lots of fun. Uh, the problem with that, yeah, you can get your issue fixed maybe, but what you get is a narrow view. You just maybe find out what's going on in your case, but there is no way of getting the big picture for what's going on, and that can help you big time in the future if you just already know what's going on. Um, so, quick poll. How many of you have actually ever done custom drawing? You are not. Um, and custom views. So, just quick raise of hands. Okay, you haven't. Yeah, doesn't count. Um, okay, for the rest of you, we're just going to have a quick introduction to the Canvas UI. So, the Canvas UI is basically, uh, sorry, the Canvas API is basically what lies behind any and every UI you see on Android, uh, at least the ones that you uh, create and draw from Java. Um, the Canvas API allows you to draw something, which is in the end your goal, uh, on a buffer. A buffer is basically a region of memory, as you probably already know, uh, and it can be backed in the hardware or in the software. We're going to see what that actually means later on, but just for now, remember that. Um, Canvas is actually a pretty vast API. You have, um, you have a lot of different uh, classes, methods, and all of them uh, abide to a particular, uh, like they have a goal. Um, but as you start working uh, with a canvas, you probably realize that, as usual, there is no documentation uh, because I have no idea why. There should be. Uh, so the thing is, well, what they don't tell you or is not so easy to get is that underneath the canvas is Skia. Uh, Skia is a 2D rendering engine, which is not only used in Android, but it's also used in uh, Chrome on every platform. Even Chrome OS uses it. Um, it's, of course, implemented in native code, so that's why I said you have to dig into native code, because you have to dig into Skia. Um, there is no documentation for Skia, pretty much. There's just a wiki with a few pages and the really uh, sparse uh, ideas on how it works. Um, but if you 
if you get to know it, Skia is actually quite nice. Um, you have, uh, you can do something from the basic stuff like uh, drawing shapes and coloring pixels, uh, but you also have uh, advanced features. So, for example, you have transfer modes, and we're going to see what that means. Um, but at the same time, as always with Android, uh, yeah, it's not so perfect, not all the time. Uh, first thing that comes to my mind when I think about Skia is that drawing text on Android, at least, is a pain. It's really hard, for example, just to set the kerning for the text if you want to draw it manually. Um, it's really hard to get a precise measurement of text size. Uh, and that is something that is pretty big. And also, again, there's some weird behaviors you might encounter from time to time. That picture you see there is from a friend of mine. You cannot really tell uh, because uh, projector, I guess. But it's basically two sets, a, a circle with a set of arcs drawn on top of it. And if you look at it, you realize that the arcs are, even though they are drawn with the same radius and everything, they don't match each other. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a problem if you find yourself in that situation because you basically have to, uh, to implement the arc drawing yourself and it's not the funniest thing ever. Um, and again, can, cannot stress it enough, there's no documentation. <laughs> okay, to be fair, it's still kind of cool. I mean, you get, you get to basically for free uh, hardware acceleration on all your drawing calls. Um, and uh, that is done uh, using hardware UI, which is a subset of Skia. A pretty funny story on how that came to be. Um, hardware UI uses OpenGL ES2 to draw on, uh, um, on the screen. And by the way, that is the reason uh, since um, OpenGL ES2 is not uh, possible to emulate it in software, unlike OpenGL ES1, uh, that is the reason why uh, Android devices have to have a hardware GPU starting from Honeycomb. Um, again, this was introduced in Honeycomb. Um, so we have it. By default, is enabled on uh, Ice Cream Sandwich and later and you shouldn't be considering anything that comes before ice cream sandwich nowadays if you do you're a bad person. Um, and as with anything else, again, that's a common theme. It's got limitations. Um, there is stuff you cannot really do with, uh, with hardware UI uh, when running on a hardware accelerated layer. Um, in that case, there's a fallback, which is just saying to Android, okay, uh, use the old software-based rendering pipeline and it will draw whatever you want to draw, but it will be slower. Um, for now, and for this presentation, we're just gonna consider hardware UI and Skia to be the same thing, so you never heard, you never hear of hardware UI going on, because it's the same thing, same API, it's just underneath. You don't really care about that, it's a mess. Um, limitations, yeah, just a quick overview. This is from the Android developer um, web page and uh, on the website. You can see there's a bunch of stuff you cannot really do when you use hardware acceleration. I will not go into details, but you can tell that things are getting better from, time, from version to version, but there, there is no roadmap on how and when stuff will be feature complete on hardware. If you're interested, I recommend you to go and read the page on hardware acceleration on the Android developers website, because uh, at least you know what you cannot do. Let's put it that way. Um, so, back to the canvas. Um, a canvas is basically representing a 2D plane, so like a piece of paper, material design. Um, so, how do you move on it? How do you draw stuff in a specific place? You have transformations, and every transformation that you see on uh, the uh, UI and the, on the canvas is a matrix transformation. So I hope you do remember linear algebra from school. Um, there is only 2D transformations, but there is a way to get pseudo 3D stuff, which is using the camera. 
The camera is a different API. Uh, it's still tied to the canvas. Uh, it's, it's nice because you can get, for example, uh, it's the way you can flip something on the Z uh, axis in, in uh, using the canvas without using OpenGL for just that thing. Um, one thing you have to remember is that all the drawing has to be done on the UI thread. Uh, in reality, some of the stuff, some of the code inside of, uh, the, of Skia could theoretically run on, uh, on a worker thread, but on Android you're stuck on the, on the UI thread unless you want to hurt yourself and use a surface view to get a synchronous drawing. But then you lose all the uh, frame synchronization that you have if you stick to the normal uh, path. So you should probably not do it unless you have really, really a need for it. But most of the times, you shouldn't be doing crazy stuff during the drawing anyway. So, And also, remember, you have 16 milliseconds per each frame you draw on the screen because you want to target 60 frames per second. So. If, you, if your frame rendering takes 30 milliseconds and you use a surface view, it's just gonna be like going with an inconsistent frame rate and delayed uh, respect from what you would expect. Last thing about the canvas is that the canvas is stateful. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, when you uh, get a canvas, it's in a given state. Uh, a state is basically conceptually the same thing that happens when you have a view or a fragment or an activity. You can save the state in a point in time, let it go, and then come do whatever you want and get back to the point where you started. And to do that, you have a pretty simple API. You have the save method of the canvas uh, or the save to count which basically gives you back uh, a number, which is the, the ID of the state you just saved. And then you do whatever you want. You transform, you, I don't know, you nuke it, whatever. Uh, and then you don't have to do, the good thing about saving the state is that you don't have to roll back your transformations by yourself. The canvas does it for you. How, does it, how do you get that? You basically call restore or restore to count if you call save to count in the first place. Um, that's it, but if you do transformations on a canvas, always remember to save and restore the state because if you don't do it, things are gonna be drawn off screen most likely at the next run. Um, so it's time for a top tip. <laughs> um, our top tip is about drawing translucent stuff on a canvas. It's fairly easy, but in some, some cases it might be tricky. There is an easy way to do it, uh, and uh, it's actually the same way the framework does it when you set the alpha on a view, for example. So what you do, instead of calling a save or save to count, you call, one of the, sa uh, you call the save layer alpha method that basically takes in an alpha value and probably some other stuff I don't remember. Um, and what it does, it basically creates an off-screen buffer and redirects all your calls, drawing calls to that buffer. So you still do your stuff normally. Uh, you draw there, you don't need to know there's an off-screen buffer, but that's what's happening. And when you call uh, restore to count using the state that you got from uh, uh, save layer alpha, the framework will composite back the stuff, will blit it back for you with an alpha value. So you can, for example, draw multiple things on the same place without caring about having all of them translucent. So maybe in the middle uh, where they intersect, the alpha will be different than other places. So it's just a trick, but it shows you that if you know about the canvas, you can actually get away with stuff that would probably get you crazy easily enough. So, uh, okay, all nice and well, bright sun shining in the sky, but 
we are here to know, to understand what's going on underneath the canvas to get actually the pixel painted on the screen. So what happens is that everything in Skia on Android is painted on a surface. What is a surface? Well, it's the intuitive concept of a surface. It's a thing where you paint on. Um, what they really are is they are buffers. So when we say canvas, uh, surface, and there's gonna be another term we have further on, they are all basically, basically the same concept. Wildly different in implementation, but the same idea for you to care about. Um, those buffers are then managed by the Surface Flinger. What the Surface fling Flinger does is a component inside of the Android code, uh, of the underneath in, in the Linux stack, that manages the buffers, so it basically prepares the screen to send to the GPU to be then drawn on screen. And those buffers uh, can be held in software, so in the system memory, in the RAM, or inside of a, of a hardware component. Um, in that case, the hardware component is actually abstracted in Android uh, using the um, hardware composer. The hardware composer, um, it's basically an abstraction over a buffer in a, a, in a memory that is not on the system memory. So it's usually on a 2D blitter, which is, for example, the GPU. Uh, it's not exactly a texture itself, but it can be mapped to a texture pretty quickly and then drawn. Um, if there is no hardware layer available, then the system will use um, a software, of course, uh, fallback, that is then managed by an OpenGL ES1 instance of the Surface Flinger. If you want to learn more about how this works, there's a pretty lengthy article on the uh, Android Open Source Project website. It's actually one of the few in-depth articles about Android Open Source Project that we have. And it's really well done. It's fairly, fairly recent. And I really recommend you to read it, even though it's incredibly long. Um, another thing, we have seen surfaces, but you don't see surfaces in Java code. You see layers. Uh, they are still basically buffers uh, that are in the memory. Uh, every canvas is backed by a layer. And uh, again, you can have inst instances where a canvas has more than one layer. Again, the example was the save layer alpha that was creating another layer. Uh, and you can actually paint like bleed the content of one layer into another one by supplying a paint, uh, a paint argument to a call. Um, there are, by the way, different types of layers. And uh, starting from Android Honeycomb, um, you can actually, on a view, set the kind of, uh, of layer that you want to be underneath the view. So you can have none, which is, means there's no off-screen buffer. You can use software, which means there is a, a secondary layer that is used as a buffer and then transferred to the primary one. Um, and there is the hardware layer, which is basically a texture uh, that is mapped into hardware memory. So it's not inside of the RAM. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty much it's similar to what we just saw on the Surface Flinger because they end up to be the same thing. One thing to say about the hardware uh, layer is that it, it's, as I said, since um, Ice Cream Sandwich, it's the default kind of layer, and it can be pretty helpful uh, accelerating some kinds of content because um, when you draw to a, um, to a hardware layer, you're not really directly drawing onto it. It's the GPU doing all the work for you. Uh, and until you call an invalidate on, the, on a view, that buffer will not be touched and it will just split it straight away. So it's really, really fast. Okay, enough detail. Uh, so let's move on. We want 
to start pushing pixels on the screen. So what happens is that we have to go back to Skia. Yay. Uh, actually, before that, uh, there's a small note about the Canvas API. As I said, the Canvas API is pretty big. There's a lot of stuff in it, and I strongly recommend you to look into them. Some of them are documented, some of them are documented, and some of them are not. Uh, but there are resources online that you can actually uh, look at, and they're usually, again, look at the code. But for now, we're just gonna talk about paint. I'm sorry, just deal with it. Um, this is for Tim, he's not here, but he will appreciate. Um, so, paint. Uh, paint is basically an object that is mapped into a native Skia object, which is SK paint, because they like prefixes. Um, and it knows, it holds all the information that Skia needs to effectively paint a pixel on the screen. So, it knows about the color, it knows about if you're using a texture, you know, if you are um, having like a stroke, the width of the stroke, the color of the stroke, all that kind of stuff. And that is the reason why all drawing calls on canvas need a paint. The paint can also handle text. Uh, yeah, it tries to. Um, there is actually a subclass of paint, which is called uh, text paint, which contains more information about uh, text. So it's basically a paint with more stuff in it. And it, go, it has like line height and uh, some other information. But what you, what you really care about for paint from now on is that you have a paint being passed on throughout the whole pipeline. So again, pipeline. What is the Skia pipeline? Well, there you go. This is the Skia pipeline. Actually, a really simplified version of the Skia pipeline. Um, as you can see, there are m mostly four big chunks of work being done on the pipeline. The first one is the path generation, which is basically you tell uh, Skia to draw something like a circle. Uh, what it does, it, it creates a path, which is a Skia object that you can actually also access from Java. Uh, and what a path is, is a, it's a composite of shapes. Uh, it defines the area that is gonna be uh, painted in the end. Um, the path that you get from the first step is then passed to rasterization because the path at that point is not a bitmap. So we need to turn it into a bitmap and that's called rasterization. Um, what comes out of the rasterization is actually the mask. It's like a stencil if you paint with um, air spray paint. It's like the same thing. In parallel, the, there is the uh, shading uh, step. The shading step is basically the step that decides how pixels are going to be painted. What that means is it basically sets the color of each pixel. Um, the source image and which is what comes out of the shading uh, step. Oh, Tim, you missed the GIF. <laughs> and the mask are then combined um, using transfer modes. And what comes out of the last step, which is called the transfer step, is the final result you can actually see on screen. There is a really, really, really good resource that I took that stall that uh, flowchart from, which is this article from uh, Lorenz Gonzalez, I think. Um, and of course I found it after I finished the first draft of the, draft of the slides, so I had to change my slides. Um, seriously, read it. It's really interesting. It's not too long and it gives you a really good overview of what happens. I'm, getting some of the stuff from there, but if you want to go into more detail, that's the place. Um, so, as you have seen in the pipeline, all the steps, almost, have uh, two phases each. It's kind of a two-pass strategy for each step where 
The first one is the one that produces the raw result, and the second one is used to refine what comes out of the step. Um, every single phase is, called, uh, is uh, collectively called as effect. An effect is basically something you can plug into to do your stuff, to change the way uh, stuff is painted. Um, the second phase, the second pass of each, uh, of each step is actually usually by default an identity. That means that what comes in goes out straight away. There is one exception to the two-pass strategy, uh, which is, again, the rasterization step. As you can see, there's a two different paths that the code can take. This is not documented anywhere. Um, so, going back to there. Okay, in the rasterization phase, you can see an outline of the pipeline just to give you an idea of where we are. Um, so, mask filters are something you have in the um, rasterization phase. What they do is they change the way the alpha is shown. You can see here on the right, we have an image that has a mask filter applied, which is a blur mask filter. By the way, the top half of the image is rendered on software, and the lower part of the image is rendered on hardware. So as you could probably tell, they don't work on hardware acceleration. Uh, there are two mask filters available in Skia. The first one is blur, that one, and the other one is emboss. Don't ever use emboss. It sucks. And they are pretty slow. So if you really, really, really want to do blurring and other stuff, I suggest you reading a series of articles on uh, styling Android. Um, they, Mark Allison goes through the steps needed to use render script to blur something. And it's faster. Uh, the only thing you have to keep in mind is that it's going into native code, so it's got some marshalling to deal with. Okay, so next step, we move to the shading phase. Uh, in the shading phase, you have shaders. They're similar conceptually to the OpenGL shaders, with the big difference that they're not programmable, meaning once you create a shader, you cannot touch it again. It's immutable. Uh, maybe at some point, they will introduce uh, mutable shaders, which actually theoretically already exist in Skia, but they're not available in Android. Um, but as all the things that get introduced in Android and being in the framework, it means that we could probably use them at some point in the future. Some future, maybe. Okay, over 9,000. Back to shaders. Uh, there is one last thing to say about shaders. Shaders are not masked because the mask is being computed in another step and they get combined later on. So what happens is that a shader actually draws everywhere. You set it to draw, you think it draws in a place, it actually doesn't. It draws on all the canvas, all over the place. It's messy. That happens if you mess up with the, uh, with the mask. You just get garbage. Um, so, how do you deal with it? You have tile modes. Uh, there are three tile modes, uh, clamp, ra uh, mirror, and repeat. Clamp is the most efficient and the one you usually want to use, which is basically telling the shader, just throw in here, I don't care about the rest. Uh, if you use, uh, if you try to paint bitmaps that, has, that have sides that are powers of two, uh, height and width, then it's almost okay to use the other ones as well. It's, everything is awesome, pretty much. Um, there are, just quickly, I'm gonna go through shaders. There are three kind of shaders. Uh, bitmap shaders are basically shaders that draw a bitmap, a texture, basically. Uh, gradient shaders, there are a bunch of them. Uh, there's a linear shader, there's a radial shader, uh, there's a sweep shader, um, and well, they paint gradients, unsurprisingly enough. Uh, you can use compose shaders to, com to combine 
two or more shaders with each other. So you can actually paint, for example, a bitmap and a gradient at the same time. On hardware, you can only have two of them, and they have to be different. On software, you can basically compo nest, compose shaders inside of each other, and create how many things you want. You will never do it, but you can. Um, another thing in second phase of the shading is color filters. What they do is they change the color that has been set by the shaders. Again, the second pass is used to adjust what came out of the first one. Um, they are uniformly applied to all the pixels. They are not programmable, so they just apply the same transformation to all of them. Again, three kind of color filters. Uh, the most used one is the first one, which is the color matrix color filter. Nice name. Um, and it basically allows you to desaturate or saturate an image, change the lightness, the brightness, uh, transform a an image from the RGB space color to the YUV, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the second one is, uh, I have no idea why you would ever want to use it, but there must be a reason for it. And the third one is the Porter Duff color filter, which basically applies um, a color to the source using a Porter Duff mode. I'm not going to go into Porter Duff modes because it would take me an hour, so just look them up on the internet. Um, last thing is transfer modes. So we have moved into the last phase of the SCIA pipeline. Um, the transfer modes are applied as the last thing. So they are what uh, actually blend the, the source, which is what came out of uh, shading, with uh, the destination. So it basically, it's what decides how the stuff you draw will be composited over what's already on the canvas. If the canvas is blank, then whatever, doesn't really matter-ish. Um, but if you already have stuff on the canvas, then it really does a difference. Uh, there are three kind of transfer modes. The first one is the avoid transfer mode. Um, it basically draws or doesn't draw stuff uh, on pixels that are within a certain distance, colorimetric distance, from the source, uh, from a reference color. Um, there is the pixel XOR transfer mode, which basically does a logical uh, XOR on every single pixel between the source and the destination. Uh, by the way, if you, use, if you use the pixel XOR, you will lose the alpha. So all the pixels you draw, no matter what you try to do, will be fully opaque. Last one is the Porter Duff transfer mode. Again, Porter Duff modes, they're basically what you get in Photoshop, all the kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of documentation on, on them, so, and even uh, in, the do, in the Android documentation, there are the formulas that the Porter Duff modes actually apply to the pixels. Um, what they do, again, is just blend in a way or another stuff. I'm not going to go into more detail. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think I'm done. Is there questions, uh, insults, that works? You forgot the tomatoes, I'm sorry, for you. <laughs> I haven't worked with um, the Canvas API since version 2.3. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that I had a huge problem at the time. I was supposed to draw an, um, a blurred image on top of the, basically on top of the desktop. So the activity had to be colored with uh, a semi-blurred, basically semi-blurred image. So it would have to take mm -hmm. the background so it was a transparent activity. It's semi-transparent and semi-blurred. So something okay. like they do on iOS 8 now, that's kind of blurry. Oh, yeah, OK. So you, you wanted to kill performances. Yeah. But okay. the, the, the problem that I had at the time is that how we solved it is we took the background, blurred it, and then uh, so we took the launcher background, blurred mm -hmm. it, and used it as our background. Problem is when you have a live wallpaper that moves, 
or something that's alive. Uh, my question was, is there a possibility to do anything else except blur an already existing image? Is, it, is there a way to draw blurry stuff on canvas, which is blurred? You mean, again, like uh, iOS 7, 8, 2? Whatever, yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, you would have to capture what's underneath it and then basically do what you have been doing. But the problem is performances. So, no, I don't think there is. I'm sorry. Any question? No? I'm not that good. Come on. <laughs> okay. Hello. Ça marche? Oui. Merci pour la présentation. I had a question. I was working with the Canvas uh, on HTML5. And they have... Doesn't that. have anything to do with HTML. No, no, I know, but okay. they have... I can, I can draw on canvas and then just invalidate a portion, a rectangle on that canvas and redraw something on it. Mm -hmm. Can we do something like yes. this on Android? Yes. Invalidate just a you can do it. Um, it's actually not done on the canvas. I mean, when you have a canvas, you basically can draw anywhere you want. But what you want to do is to call... On reuse, the view, is reuse a canvas, invalidate a portion of it, and redraw. You I don't want. do it on the canvas. You do it on the view. You call invalidate. Okay. There's a bunch of overloads of the invalidate method of view, and at least one of them takes a region. So you just tell it invalidate and redraw just this region. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really nice. Um, you told that you may have some issues with rendering tests and stuff. Can you make an example of what kind of issues you can have with text? Uh, well, it's a long story. Um, first of all, you have to know that up to Android, I think it was 4.2, probably, uh, there was a different uh, text renderer. So. They, uh, Google teamed up with Adobe at a certain point in time, and they open sourced Adobe's own uh, font uh, hinter. Uh, what you get is basically better text quality uh, than before, but it's still not as perfect as probably I would want to see it. But um, some of the issues, as I mentioned before, um, if you want to change the, the kerning, so the distance between each letter, uh, you have to use a really hacky way, which is basically cycling through every character using a spannable string builder and create a span with a negative margin so that you get the letters close together, but it's rel really bad and really slow. So it's not something you can do, for example, for big chunks of text. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, could you uh, describe a little more about the difference between a surface and a, a canvas? Because uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, canvas. There was like the canvas is what you see in Java, and in the end, whatever you draw on a canvas is actually drawn on a surface, which is like a physical the actual physical support for what is drawn on the canvas. But the surface is at the low level, almost at the hardware level. It's in the, uh, it's in the surface flinger. So it's basically a whole screen. It's hard to explain it. Uh, so basically, boils down to um, the canvas is the area you work on and it maps on a layer, which in turn maps into a surface. So but the surface, uh, layer, and canvas are the same concept, but at a different level of extraction, going from the hardware, which is basically showing a surface. Uh, you get um, surfaces being composed together by the surface flinger. And, get, and then shown, but what are surfaces? They get 
painted using layers. And what are layers? They get painted from canvases. This is simplest as I could get. Yeah. <coughs> I have another question. <coughs> Sorry. About the latency. Uh, I try to have uh, something more um, faster as possible. Uh, but uh, when I paint, there are a time, a very long time, between uh, the touch event and when the, the pixel is supposed to be drawn. Do you know some way to optimize that? <laughs> Hard question? Uh, question? Optimize your code? <laughs> uh, no, optimize honestly, you, 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 maybe. <laughs> outside of what your code does, you don't really have control over that. So the only thing you can do is to make sure that you stay in the, the shortest time possible because stuff gets drawn on the screen in three steps. The first one is uh, measurement. So yes, <laughs> stuff gets <laughs> measured. <laughs> Good choice. Uh, stuff gets measured. So views uh, are basically asked by their containers how big they need to be. Uh, then the container lays the, view, the views out, and then all the views are asked to paint themselves on a canvas. Um, what happens is all this stuff has to be run within 16 milliseconds at most, because if you don't, you just drop frames. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, really, the only part you can act on is your code unfortunately. So if you're working on a device that is really slow bleating stuff, or if you're, I mean, you just have to simplify your layout as much as possible. Avoid using uh, double pass uh, layouts as much as you can, meaning relative layout, uh, linear layout with weights, and maybe custom layouts, because all of them are uh, re require two passes of measurement and so take more time to, uh, to do that. And also keeping, as always, keeping the views hierarchy as flat as possible, as simple as possible. And actually, custom views are a good way to get that because um, basically layouts and views on Android have to handle all the possible cases. So if you just need one thing and you need it to be quick and you have way, less constra way more constraints on what could happen, compared to the framework stuff, you could build a view that basically does just what you need. So it's going to be faster than the equivalent code in the framework. But that's a completely whole new subject <laughs> to discuss. Uh, but yeah, that's probably custom views, uh, simpler layouts, and optimizing your drawing code. I mean, remember that. You can optimize stuff on, uh, on when you draw on canvases because what counts, what matters in the, in the end is what, what it looks like. So if you can cheat, do cheat. So if you can pre-compute, if you can cache stuff, if you can save time in any possible way, that's the only thing you can do. So. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, hi, uh, I had a question about hardware layers yep. um, and the amount you can allocate before your application actually crashes. There yeah. is no correlation. Oh. So okay. hardware layers are um, basically portions of memory, of a memory that is not in the system memory, so it's not in the RAM. So it. Think of it as a separate memory chip. Yeah, but that's and you can allocate stuff on there as long as you have memory. But when you run out of that memory, the system automatically uses system memory, which is lower, but still works. So your application will run out of memory on the heap because you allocate too many bitmaps or because you have leaks or whatever. But it's not related with hardware layers. Okay. I don't know if I've explained myself. Um, okay. Just say no if not. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, I'll, ta I'll take if, your if you, if you want, I can go over that again. Uh, yeah, I have to go now. 
because uh, okay. they don't like me. Thank you. Thank you.